Bruchem Aboim. I want to welcome everyone to our home. Thank you for coming. The, um, this week on my thoughts, again, the lecture will be, why no warning? So, my question is, I'd like to understand why we read in the Torah. They got away, destroyed the cities of Sodom and Amorah. However, nowhere, nowhere in the portion did we read the God Almighty warn the residents of the cities of their impending doom. We do read that Abram Avinu, Abraham our father, tried to intercede on their behalf. However, there is no mention in the Torah of any warning given to the residents of the cities concerning God's intent to destroy them. You know, they tell a story about Reb Zusha. Reb Zusha was a great tzaddik. He would travel around the country, initially incognito, dressed as an itinerant beggar. He wore a tattered coat with a rope around his waist. He sported a scraggly beard. He really looked the part. It happened that once he found himself in a small town for the Shabbat. After Friday night services, all the poor people would gather at the back of the synagogue. And then the Shamus, the sexton, would then direct different people to congregants' homes uh, for their Shabbat meal. It happened that after everyone was placed, the shamus looked and realized that there was still one poor man left without a place to eat. That person was Reb Zusha. And so the shamus had no choice but to invite Reb Zusha back to his home for the Friday night meal. As the shamus was making his preparations for the dinner, he looked over to Reb Zusha, and he couldn't help but notice that Reb Zusha was kissing his hands. Reb Zusha saw the expression on the shamus' face, and he smiled. He said to the shamus, I know that you think I must be a Michigan. I must be crazy. But let me explain to you. All year round, an esrig hangs on a tree, and no one pays it much attention. But then one week of the year on Sukkot, this fruit becomes the center of attention. Everyone wants to look at it, admire it, hold it, even make a blessing over it. You see... It is true that I, Rezusha said to the shamus, it's true that I am nothing and a nobody, but tonight you have brought me into your house to fulfill the great mitzvah of Achnosis Orchid, of inviting guests into your home, hospitality. Well, that makes me a holy object, much like a pair of tefillin or a, or a safer Torah. I ask you, shouldn't I kiss myself? You know, one of God's greatest traits is what we call Erech long-suffering. We have a tradition that God wants to remove the sin, not the sinner. What was so different about the Sodomites? That God Almighty felt that they were beyond any salvation. They had, so to speak, crossed the line. They had become much like a cancer that needed to be surgically removed as soon as possible. If we look into the Torah, we find many occasions where God took his time and showed extreme patience before he exacted punishment on a nation or a city that were guilty of transgressions. We read in the portion of Noah that before God destroyed the world with a flood, he first instructed Noah to warn the populace. Noah did so for 120 years as he built the ark. It was only after the generation ignored Noah's warnings that God finally brought the flood and destroyed the world. Then we read in the book of Exodus, in the book of Shemos, that in Egypt God brought ten plagues on the Egyptians before they finally conceded to free their Jewish slaves. However, if you look closely at the ten plagues, you will notice that only one, the last plague, the killing of the firstborn, is actually referred to as a maka, makos pechoros. If that was the case, what were the other nine incidents that the Egyptians experienced? Answer, they were meant to be instructional. They were the actions of a benevolent father who tried to bring the Egyptians to the point of tshuva, to repentance. You see, they needed to repent for the injustices that they had perpetrated against their Jewish slaves. Tough love. Why didn't they heed God's warning? Pardon me, when they didn't heed God's warning then, he had no cho other choice but to bring the only true plague on the Egyptians. Again, the killing of the firstborn. We also read in the book of Jonah, of Jonah. Jonah was commanded by God to go to the city of Nineveh and warn them that in 30 days God was going to destroy the city. 
When the residents of the city heard Jonah's warning, they all did tshuva. Even the king himself donned sackcloth and ashes. Seeing their sincere tshuva, their repentance, God rescinded his decree. So we see that after they were warned by the prophet, they then repented and they then were saved from total destruction. When we study the history of the Jewish nation, we observe that before God destroyed both of his temples and exiled the nation, that initially he sent prophets such as Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, to warn the people of their upcoming doom. The nation failed to heed God's warnings. This resulted in both temples being destroyed and the people driven into exile. They didn't listen, nor did they learn. In all of these scenarios, God sent a warning before he acted. Even in the case of the Mitzorah, the leper, a person who was guilty of speaking lush and horror, tail-bearing about another person. The Torah first tells us that God Almighty would not punish the sinner's body immediately. First, he would afflict their house with leprosy. If the guilty party still did not repent, then God Almighty would afflict their clothing with leprosy. It was only after these two warnings failed to bring the sinner to a state of tshuva that God would bring the plague of leprosy on the sinner's body. So what was so different about the sins of the Sodomites that God felt that he had no alternative but to totally destroy them and the land upon which they sinned? God felt compelled to administer their punishment without any warning whatsoever. Well, since nothing is an accident, we have to wonder as to why the story of Sodom appears in the same Torah portion as Avinu and the three angels. The portion of Vayera opens with the words Vayera Hashem, and God appeared to him. So we read that God came to visit Avinu, Abraham our father, on the third day after his circumcision. The third day is found to be the most painful day after one has undergone any surgical procedure. So from God's action, we learn that the great mitzvah of Hachnosah Zorchim, again, visiting the sick. Rashi tells us that since Abravina was infirmed, God did not want him bothered with guests. So God took the sun out of its sheath and made the day unbearably hot. This was done so that people would not travel on the road. However, God then realized that Abravino felt more pain about the loss of the guest that he did than he did concerning the pain of his circumcision. That being the case, God then arranged for three angels in the guise of men, dressed up as travelers, to approach Abravino's tent. When Abravino sees the three men angels, he asks God to please excuse him since he wanted to fulfill the great myths of Hafnos of inviting guests into one's house. As I mentioned before, Rashi tells us that God made the day so hot so that Avram Avinu would not be bothered with guests, which tells us just how great the mitzvah of taking in guests really is. If Avram was in the presence of God Almighty himself, and yet he excused himself and ran to offer hospitality to three strange men who he assumed that were Arab merchants, one would have thought that being in the presence of God Almighty would be enough for Abravina to ignore any and all guests. After all, we have been taught by our sages the concept of Osek B'mitzvah taught Patrim in a mitzvah, that one who is involved with the mitzvah of good deed is exempt from performing any other mitzvah. But we see that God's presence was not enough. And from this episode, we learn that the mitzvah hachnosah orkin of taking in guests is even greater than entertaining the Shekhinah, God Almighty himself. You know, this may be the reason that these, these two seemingly unrelated events occur in the same Torah portion. The people of Sodom were the antithesis of Avram Avinu. In Sodom, it was considered a capital offense to extend hospitality to strangers. Rashi states that the act that sealed the fate of the citizens of Sodom was an incident where a poor man was seen living in the city streets. Well, the town fathers were surprised that he was still alive, since no one was permitted to offer him hospitality. So, so they investigated, and they found that there was a certain young lady 
who was secretly feeding this poor man. She had committed a grievous crime, and she was tried and then sentenced to death. They hung her naked body from the wall of the city. Then they covered her with honey, and the bees attacked her body, and she died a torturous death. This then was the act that sealed their fate. The mitzvah that trumped even entertaining the Shechina to them was considered a capital offense. With her execution, they had unknowingly ordered their own execution. Now, we see God's displeasure with those who abstain from the midst of taking in wayfarers and feeding them. We read in the story of Ruth, Rus, that it was only female members of the nations of Moab and Ammon that are permitted to marry within the nation of Israel. Member, male members are not permitted. The reason given is that neither of these two nations offered the children of Israel provisions while they were on the road. Being that it is only men that would have participated in this type of hospitality, since in those days women were confined to their tent. This lack of hospitality by the men of these two nations prevented their descendants from ever entering into the mainstream members of the Jewish nation. We read in the Torah in the portion of Chayasur about Eliezer, the servant of Avram. He was sent by his master to Haran to find a bride for his master's son, Yitzchak. In his prayer to God Almighty, Eliezer asked God to show him a girl who would excel in the attribute of hospitality. He wanted to find someone who would volunteer to bring water not only for himself, but also for the men who had accompanied him. That was in addition to watering all the ten camels that they had ridden. Since Yitzchak's greatest attribute was gavura, discipline and severity, Eliezer was searching for a soulmate that would be an azer connecto, that would personify exactly the opposite, a girl with the trait of kindness and a charitable nature. Unbeknown to Eliezer, this trait would be essential to Yitzchak in his later years, since in his later years he would, be, he would become blind, which would have necessitated a warm caretaker, someone who excelled in the attribute of kindness. Her acts of kindness and hospitality had been passed on to her descendants throughout our history. Now we read in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, the Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai asked five his five illustrious students, what were the best and worst traits that a person should cultivate? They all gave different answers, but he concluded that the best trait, that which included all of their traits, was a lave tov, a good heart. On the other hand, he felt that the worst trait that one could entertain was a lave ra, an evil heart. This then describes the citizens of Sodom, they suffered from an evil heart. This then brought about their total and complete annihilation. I find it interesting. You know, if you were to ask most people, they would tell you that they would prefer to be wealthy, which makes sense. But many times the test of success and wealth is more than people can handle. We witness this with the generation of the flood and also with the Sodom that they both existed in a time of extreme wealth and prosperity. Yet, instead of elevating the people, somehow, it brought about the worst in them. It brought about not only their destruction, but it even brought about the total destruction of the earth that they resided on. Now, I've told the story before about the Apta Rebbe and the poor man who entertained many guests in his simple hut. He treated them all as royalty, when the Atta Rebbe went to visit this poor man, he was so impressed with his sincere acts of generosity and hospitality that he blessed him. He said to this poor man that he should be able to continue his mitzvah of taking in guests in a state of wealth rather than in poverty. The Rebbe's blessings came true, and the poor man soon became exceedingly wealthy. But then something strange occurred. Somehow he became a miser. He shut the door of his mansion to the poor and to the destitute. I find it sad but true that somehow people are many times nicer and more godly when they are poor and oppressed rather than when they are rich and free. When you are blessed with wealth, security, position, many times God is not 
on the front burner. If Mashiach were to call, you might answer the phone, but you would most likely put him on hold. Whereas when you are poor and oppressed and, and there's a Cossack knocking at your door, well, somehow Mashiach sounds like a great idea. You know, today we live in a world that has never seen such wealth, luxury, and innovation. But much like the generation of the flood and of Sodom, we seem to find success a hard pill to swallow. I think that it is time for us all to take a step back and look at the many blessings that we enjoy. Let us all try to use our blessings of affluence to elevate us as a ladder to heaven rather than a descent into the dark and deep abyss of misery and destruction. And with that message, let us all make an effort to change the direction of our world today so that we can usher in the coming of Messiah Tzikeno and not total liberation. Again, let me thank you for attending. Again, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. God should bless you with happiness and health and safety, all that is good. Shabbat Shalom again. Thank you for attending.